the modern India, I think around 1960s or 1970s, they took this position that these Hindus, they have some, some fetish about the cow. So we, it will be difficult to organize commercial killing of cow. So let us shift to the buffalo. The Indian expert firm took the position that uh, it will be all right to kill the buffalo, uh, though it will be very difficult to arrange for the killing of cow in India. So with this kind of advice and the kind of buffalo programs, breeding programs, killing programs that we, we organized, uh, by 2017, India had become one of the largest exporters of beef in the world. Now, to produce 40 lakh tons of uh, carcass weight of uh, uh, buffalo meat, we will need to kill about 3 crore buffaloes. 3 crore is, amounts to almost 1 lakh buffaloes every day. Namaskar, I had a little bit before I was listening to your first talk. It was uh, high history, high philosophy. Uh, from there, we are going to come down to something very mundane now. Something as mundane as the buffalo. Uh, and uh, it's killing and it's eating, things of that kind. Uh, which perhaps have relation to with this high ideas of what is violence and what is non-violence and what India has been thinking about these issues. But I'll be talking about things which are uh, numbers and statistics and uh, what has happened over the last about 20 years that as India has emerged as the one of the largest exporters of beef in the world. Perhaps the, uh, uh, this is an image of a of buffalo. I don't know how did I saw this uh, uh, this animal in Datia districts. Bundelkhand used to be a great uh, region uh, for cow protection for cows. It, there are stories about how the Bundelkhand kings uh, used to fight with those people who did not have enough uh, uh, respect for the cow. Like there's there's one particular incident when one of the Bundela kings uh, goes and attacks the Gondraja. And the main reason is that, that he did not respect the cow enough. Uh, but now Bundelkhand largely has buffaloes. I have I've gone around the region. Uh, you rarely see a cow in the region as you don't see a cow in Punjab or Haryana or much of Western UP. This is something which has happened over the last about 30 years that we have stopped rearing the cow, especially in the part of India where we are, we are living. Incidentally, uh, uh, there is another image of the buffalo. Of course, buffalo, when you look at it, it doesn't look, uh, uh, it looks dissimilar to the cow. That, uh, but uh, it does It uh, whenever you you look at its size, it it has a forlorn look on it. That uh, it seems asking for pity from you, asking for empathy and sympathy from you. Uh, in fact, when I went to Bundelkhand, I kept on taking photographs of of uh, buffaloes of in various moods and <laughs> shapes, but. Uh, it may not be the cow, but it's not very dissimilar animal. When we were young, uh, our house, our my parents insisted that till there were young people in the house, they kept a cow. But neighbors kept a buffalo. And we always used to think that the, we are superior uh, because uh, we get cow's milk. And the neighbors were doing some commerce with that milk. And we, we always thought that in a house like ours, we doesn't, one doesn't take uh, anything else but cow's milk. But that, that period is past, that period is past. But uh, even then, 
the buffalo was not a very different animal than the cow. It is, uh, it was slightly different. It is cleverer, smarter. You like it more. But beyond that, it is not a, a different species of animal. That is, in this case, of course, uh, scientifically it may be a different species. I don't know, but it is not a different variety of animal. Now, cow protection, we all know, is, is essential to India, uh, whether anybody likes it or not. India is the country of, uh, that protects the cow. And cow protection uh, in India uh, is not merely cow protection. You can, you can read several quotes, several different texts to show that cow protection means much more than merely merely loving the cow and protecting the cow. What I am quoting is uh, uh, Mahatma Gandhi because this is the appropriate time to be quoting Mahatma Gandhi. Is his 150th uh, anniversary birth year and uh, uh, and Mahatma Gandhi has talked a great deal about cow protection. Here he is saying. I do not hesitate to call myself with all firmness, though humbly, a strict Snatni Hindu Vaishnava. I believe that the most important outward form of Hinduism is cow protection. That he was consistently clear that one basic thing outwardly that defines Hinduism is cow protection. And this is, of course, this 1921, he is very angry with the uh, the, the peak of the non-cooperation movement and certain issues is very angry with that. And so he says, I regard the Hindu world as important because at present not a single Hindu is capable of giving that protection to the cow. And among these important people, I believe myself to be the least important because he thought he is doing the maximum at that point of time for cow protection. And he thought a Hindu which cannot protect the cow is a Hindu not worth the name, is an important Hindu. That's what he kept on saying repeatedly. And this is, of course, this is the limit. To me, the meaning of cow protection includes the protection of the chastity of our women. We will not have a regret, we will not have a regenerate India unless we learn to respect our women as we respect our mothers, sisters and daughters. He would relate almost anything which is wrong with India with not respecting and protecting the cow enough. Uh, in another statement of the same period, and this is a very important uh, quotation from him, he is saying the central fact of Hinduism, however, is cow protection. Co-protection to me is one of the most wonderful phenomena in human evolution. It takes the human being beyond his species. The cow to me means the entire subhuman world. Man through the cow is enjoined to realize his identity with all that lives. Why the cow was selected for apotheosis is obvious to me. The cow is a poem of pity. One reads pity in the gentle animal. She is the mother to millions of Indian mankind. Protection of the cow means protection of the whole dumb creation of God. The ancient seer, whoever he was, began with the cow. The appeal of the lower order of creation is all the more forcible because it is speechless. Cow protection is the gift of Hinduism to the world. And Hinduism lives as long as there are Hindus to protect the cow. But what is important in this quotation is that he is saying cow protection is not merely protecting the cow. It is a symbol for protecting the whole of creation and especially that what he is calling the dumb, uh, speechless creation, the animals with whom we live all the time. But uh, though this was the position of India and one could quote more classical sources to say the same thing. Uh, but the, the modern India, I think around 1960s or 1970s, they took this position that these Hindus, they have some, some fetish about the cow. 
so we it will be difficult to organize commercial killing of cow so let us shift to the buffalo uh, because buffalo obviously is not cow and uh, uh, of the hindu fetish is about the cow and not about animal as such so we will we will organize uh, commercial scientific uh, high end killing of the buffalo to circumvent the killing of the cow and this uh, you can start seeing in the reports of the of the planning commission various subcommittees saying this from around Uh, 1970 it became big uh, from i think 1990s or something like that our constitution uh, when it provided protection protection the cow it was clear that the protection is not for the cow alone it is for what the article 48 of the constitution says the state shall endeavor to organize agriculture and animal husbandry on modern scientific lines uh, and shall in particular take steps for preserving and improving the breeds and prohibiting the slaughter of cows and calves and other milch and draft cattle so it was not only cows it was all agricultural animals that the uh, constitution enjoined upon the state of india to protect and preserve uh, but as i said the indian expert world took the position that uh, it will be all right to kill the buffalo uh, though it will be very difficult to arrange for the killing of cow in india though if they could do that they would have perhaps wanted to do that also because for cow meat there is much better market than for buffalo meat in the world so this is uh, from a working group on animal husbandry of the 10th plan uh, and this is uh, uh, this was pv bhatt uh, under whom this uh, group was set up he was the one of the dgs of icar government should recognize that culling and utilization of surplus animals is an established norm for animal production improvement a few states have made laws restricting slaughter of buffalo calves and young male buffaloes which need to be reviewed and this is uh, this report was at the time of uh, the first government of uh, honorable shri atal bihari vajpayee ji this report was given to somnath animal preservation acts of the states need to be reviewed so that constraints if any affecting prop affecting proper utilization of livestock could be removed uh, the next is the so this were the kind of uh, uh, planning that was being done from and, and repeatedly in fact we tend to tend to blame the politicians for various things is the expert system of india is the professionals who have been arranging to give this kind of advice later in this report at one place he says in this report they say that there are large number of organizations in india Uh, who are working for the protection of the cow and the buffalo and their activities must be restricted and this is coming not from a political uh, body is coming from an expert group of the planning commission so with this kind of advice and the kind of buffalo programs breeding programs killing programs that we we organized uh, by 2017 india had become one of the largest exporters of beef in the world uh, in 2017 these numbers have changed later in 2017 india uh, exported about 18 lakh tons of uh, buffalo meat and uh, brazil 18.5 lakh tons but when the numbers were first compiled india was 18.5 in brazil was 18 lakh tons and there's much news that now we have become the number one in the world this is those are provisional numbers they have been uh, reworked but still that was the year when india exported almost the highest in the world in 2019 the indian export has come down a little there are reasons for it which will come but uh, india keeps exporting 
around this number between 16 to 18 lakh tons, 16 to 20 lakh tons. According to the international statistics, uh, you know over the other la larger importers, Brazil, Australia, USA and New Zealand. Now, these three, four countries with whom we are competing, in terms of their geography, in terms of their, their area, they have nothing common with India. Now, Australia and New Zealand will have huge open uninhabited lands where you have only farms and nothing else. And the USA, of course, again is, a, is such a huge geography where you have large areas where there will be hardly any human habitation except for farming for, for uh, meat. Now, they do in, indulge in this, this is understandable. In India, can you find one area in the world, in India, which is not inhabited? Well, even Himalayas are inhabited. Where do you, where do you get the wherewithal for producing 18 lakh tons of meat for export? Uh, this will have to, you will have to deprive much else from, uh, in order to produce this. Because your land is not easily available for, for raising uh, uh, meat animals. Incidentally, 18 lakh tons is a very, very big number. Uh, it uh, amounts to uh, almost uh, 3 to 4 kg per capita per year of, uh, uh, of uh, for every person in India, you are exporting 3 kg, 3 kg of meat to the world. That's what it means. Our total meat consumption is about 4, 4 and a half kg. And uh, we are producing another 3 kg per capita in order to export. Uh, as I said, those numbers are from international sources, in the state business. India, uh, APIDA gives that uh, we have this authority for promotion of uh, agriculture uh, products. Uh, uh, normally, we are told that about 13 to 16 lakh tons of deboned beef is exported every year as far as the APIDA goes. And this will be equivalent to 20 to 25 lakh tons of carcass weight. Uh, production of uh, uh, meat in India is about 40 lakh tons, double of this. As I said, per capita we eat about 3.5, we export about 3. That's all. That's all. Now, to produce 40 lakh tons of uh, carcass weight of uh, uh, buffalo meat, we will need to kill about 3 crore buffaloes. 3 crore is, amounts to almost 1 lakh buffaloes every day. Uh, and this is a very huge number, that uh, killing of 1 lakh, slaughtering of 1 lakh. And so, uh, we, we slaughter 3 crore buffaloes, which is 1 lakh buffaloes per day. And of these, of this 1 lakh per day that we kill, half are female buffaloes and uh, the rest are male calves. In fact, 45% of the whole male stock of, of buffaloes in India is slaughtered every year. Half of the male stock is slaughtered every year. And this 3 crore uh, buffaloes that we kill, half of those are done are in Uttar Pradesh. All of the meat production of India, half of is being 48 percent is in Uttar Pradesh. Uttar Pradesh has 42 abattoirs uh, approved by APEDA. And you know, each of these abattoirs kills about, uh, slaughters about 1000, at least 1000 buffaloes a day. So, you can get that number of 50,000. If you have 42 of them, you'll be actually killing about 50,000 every day because this will be all killing, uh, slaughtering about 1,000 to 1,200 per day. Uh, after that comes Maharashtra, which has 13 abattoirs and 11% uh, of the, of the uh, beef produced. Punjab of all the places. 
there is a small place in Punjab next to Chandigarh, Dera Bassi. And some entrepreneurs of Delhi, uh, I would name, I could name them, but I will not. They decided to develop that as another hub of buffalo killing. And small, Punjab is a very small state, UP is a very big state. But 9% of the uh, killing of buffaloes is happening in that one small area of, uh, of Punjab. Uh, Kerala has 7.31% but most of this is for, for local consumption. Kerala has one state which eats beef in a big way. So there are no approved, export approved abettors there. All of it is local. Telangana in Hyderabad is another area which dwell, was developed as a as a beef producing region. Uh, Telangana, Andhra Pradesh, of course, were one. Together, they were doing 13 percent of the beef killing. In fact, uh, those who can this 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 number and this number can be related to much else of the of the uh, of the demography of India. Uh, uh, of course, the Punjab number cannot be related to the demography. It is happening uh, as a as an exercise by a certain set of of uh, entrepreneurs. Bihar again, like Kerala, whatever five percent is produced is not for export. Export is basically Uttar Pradesh, Maharashtra, Telangana, Andhra Pradesh. That's where the export quality killing is of the uh, being done. No, this has, as I was trying to say, this has not happened on its own. This, there is an agency of India, uh, this, uh, I think, Agriculture Products Export Development Authority of India. There is an APIDA Act uh, through which this authority was set up. And its mandate is, its mandate as in the Act is uh, a promotion of fruit, vegetable and their products. Promotion of meat and meat products, poultry and poultry products, dairy products, and there are 14 other right, uh, total 14 items are there, which also includes honey and, uh, and uh, a large number of diverse items. But APIDA, when it restates this uh, act in its own manuals, it uh, puts meat on the top. In fact, uh, the schedule of the act is uh, re when they rewrite. They put meat and meat products on the top, poultry next, and the fruit is taken to the fourth. The uh, appetite was not created only to do meat export, but they took it there it to be the mandate to do buffalo export as a priority. Uh, now, this uh, agency actually has uh, done hand holding, created subsidies, brought the technology. Uh, in fact, its manual will tell you in great detail how the animal has to be killed, what is the kind of cuts which have to be performed. So, it will give you pictures that only these cuts will be allowed. So, it is actually a, a, a meat promotion agency of the government of India, which has promoted this and does it with great work. One of the things its manuals say that all meat uh, produced in India for, expo for in APIDA approved abattoirs will be halal. And it's just not uh, will be a halal of any kind, it's just not that it has to be certified halal. So, for it to be certified, uh, the manual says that all animals must be slaughtered by a halal method in the presence of holy men. Assigned by All India jamaat e ulama hind as per Islamic Sharia for certification. And I couldn't believe my eyes when a, an agency of the government of India writes in its manual that you have to hire a, a holy man from a particular Islamic agency. And, and in fact, in the more detailed manual, there will be also writing down how much you must pay for it. And incidentally, this is surprising. I don't know why are they insisting on uh, halal because 
of the meat buffalo meat exported from india nearly half goes to vietnam and vietnam has not a single muslim in its population and uh, uh, there are also countries like philippines and thailand which are amongst the top 5 four, five six importers from india they have maybe 5 to 6% muslim in population and the meat which goes to vietnam actually is meant for china <laughs> because vietnam doesn't consume that much of buffalo meat uh, and vietnam is otherwise fairly rich agriculturally they will be producing much of their meat and why does it go via china via vietnam because china doesn't want to buy directly from india and for that we keep entering into all kinds of arguments that china should somehow agree to buy directly from india and one of the reasons china keeps on giving for not uh, buying from india is that india uh, has this uh, what's called hand foot and mouth disease and hand foot and mouth disease is a is a uh, infectious disease and they don't want to get meat uh, and that's the argument they give they they get that same meat from vietnam but they don't want to buy from directly from india uh, that disease is actually a very significant disease which should be eradicated from india there's no no doubt about it that the, that this is should be eradicated but china uh, keeps on playing games with it uh, i told you that the the uh, that uh, uh, export last year 2019 2018-19 has come down by about 15 20% from india that is because china decided that from vietnam also they will not take the indian meat so in, if you had gone through the reports of the last 4 uh, 6 4 5 months the indian meat industry has been crying they do something about it because our total uh, from according to the epida numbers from about 14 lakh tons the export came down to 11 lakh tons and china can do it any time because they can decide not to net to take from vietnam and then our industry is immediately impacted incidentally and this i am not holding against the, our current government uh, our government when it uh, uh, when modi government came for the second time one of the first decisions it made was to launch a program for eradication of uh, foot and mouth disease uh, and they i think have assigned something like 13000 crores for the next 5 uh, years to be spent this decision itself is important decision it should be we should not have that disease in india but if it is as it has been reported in the press it has been taken to convince china that they can buy from it i don't believe that it is taken for that purpose but if you read the print article the wire article they are saying that this is a this is a decision uh, taken for uh, for encouraging export from india uh, but i hope we are not negotiating these things with china we we don't need to negotiate on there are many things we need to negotiate with china but that they should eat our buffaloes that is not the kind of thing we need to negotiate with them no when you do this large scale slaughter of buffaloes make it a commercial animal this has impact on the uh, the cattle herd that you have in the country the if you look at this this is the share of buffaloes in total bovine population of india it used to be 21 percent in 1951 it's been systematically rising and it has reached this 2012 was the last uh, animal census for which we have the data it reached 36 percent now this is a very large proportion this was this is the change which led to our not seeing any cows in Punjab or in Anana, cows or bullocks or in Bidilkand or much of Madhya Pradesh, much of Uttar Pradesh, you don't see cows anymore. And I'll show you that the changes in uh, in the ratio of cow, buffaloes to cows are much more in those states which indulge in slaughter and much less in states where the that kind of slaughter doesn't occur. 
uh, we had we in the last census we have 19 crore cows and nearly 11 crore buffaloes uh, the it used to be uh, one amongst the uh, this will be what will be that number 155 millions so this was 15 crores in 1951 we have gone up from 15 crores to 19 crores as far as the cows are concerned and we had uh, 43 4 crore uh, buffaloes and those have gone to 11 crores so that is the kind of uh, distorted growth which has occurred of the cattle herd in India. Uh, incidentally, whenever modern systems of production and uh, exploitation come into any area, these ratios and these ratios of cows to buffaloes which he had would have been a very old ratio which would have been capped. This keeps start changing. Once I looked at this, that when we did green revolution, the ratio between in 60-61, the ratio between total uh, uh, total food grains and pulses, it used to be 60, uh, 85 percent and 15 percent in 60s here. We had 85 percent in the food grains were cereals, 15 percent were pulses. It came has come down to 92 percent and 8 percent. Pulses have gone down at to that level and obviously you cannot run a society of the India kind on on 8 percent pulses. So what we do that we produce 23 million tons, we import another 15 million tons because without that there will be crisis. Uh, I think we will be importing cow milk soon if we go in the direction which are which are going. Uh, in that, incidentally there was also this difference that rice and uh, wheat there was a ratio of uh, 42 to 42% rice, 14% wheat. Uh, rice used to be three times that of uh, wheat. Uh, India is not a, really a wheat, uh, we don't know in the north. India is not a wheat consuming country. India is a country of rice. If you go a little beyond our northern, northwestern area, everybody eats rice. But this ratio is now, our production is almost equal rice and wheat production is almost equal that's what the green revolution did and because we did this distortion we carried out massive campaigns to teach the south indians to eat wheat well, actually then i know of this massive campaigns that we carried out that and we also carried out massive campaigns to tell indians that you can get proteins from sources other than pulses so the, in the 70s, I had once quoted a book uh, for the school children where there was a quotation that eating rice alone is not good, eat egg with it. Because pulses are not there and only yesterday, day before yesterday, we had this uh, Shimnadar standing in, in, in the headquarters of our houses and he's, he said that my daughter uh, in the schools of Rajasthan is forcing them to eat chicken because people should not be deprived of children should not be deprived of proteins. We did the deprivation by bringing down the pr pulse production to 8 percent. So this is a big huge uh, uh, lobby around which will try to shift you from your ways of eating and being to other ways of eating and being which perhaps also help in commercial development that I am not yeah, but there is no way India would have having out of Indian food grain production pulses should be only 8 percent there is nothing and it would have never happened in the history of India except in the last 20 to 30 years. This kind of distortion occur when the modern system intervene in the production systems of the classical standard uh, arrangements in agriculture or in animal husbandry. Uh, the kind of thing that now is happening between the cows and buffaloes is what happened in the even in the coarse cereals and what we call other cereals, not coarse cereals. 29% of our food production used to be of other cereals and now it is 16% and this also has changed from 13 to 16 because there is a current new 
uh, uh, emphasis on we need to eat uh, uh, coming again from somewhere else that we need to eat cereals other than rice and wheat. Okay, I was saying that this distortion which occurs is much more in uh, uh, between the ratio of the uh, uh, of the cows and buffaloes is much more in states which do more of slaughter than in states which do not do slaughter. Uh, this is India. Uh, this figure is uh, uh, cows. This is buffaloes. Uh, 19 crore cows and 11 crore buffaloes. Though uh, this has been rising the the other part. Uh, you look at Uttar Pradesh. This has 30 crore buffaloes and less than 20 crore cows. In the land of cow protection, in the Jise um, they call it the cow belt. Uh, in the cow belt, you have more buffaloes because uh, the average experts think buffaloes can be killed and less cows and this ratio is continuously changing in 1997 uh, cows were a little more than buffaloes in this about 15 years the buffaloes have become way above the of the number of cows so your actions of exporting meat supporting developing enterprise of exporting meat it has consequences uh, across the board, it is not uh, it's, uh, it's not a minor uh, intervention in the. Uh, it's like changing your demography. That's the kind of intervention you are making. You have changed the demographic balance of the your agricultural animal population. Uh, I used to think that the Indian government uh, it makes policies that doesn't have impact on the in the data. In fact. Uh, when I saw the uh, the what are you aware that this population pyramids which show you the number of men and women in different age groups that's called an education pyramid uh, the demographic pyramid I was looking at the demographic pyramids of China and uh, I was surprised to see that uh, the pyramids were dancing according to the policy they were making that is you could in the pyramid see where was the two child policy where was the one child policy when was the one child policy relax you could see so i used to say that indian government makes policies but you cannot see it in the in the population pyramid but in the population pyramid of the of the cattle of the agriculture animal you are clearly seeing the impact of the of the uh, policies of the indian government that we are following uh, there's another strange thing about the buffalo herd of India. Uh, out of these uh, 18 crore buffaloes, uh, 56 plus 38, uh, almost 11 crores, and 10, uh, about 9 and a half crores, are females. And uh, just about a little more than a crore, crore and a half are males. What is happening to these males? Well, out of a total head of 11 crores or 10 crores, you have more than 9 crore uh, male, uh, females and only about a crore or so uh, males. And uh, amongst the males, there are only 50 lakh adults and a crore are calves. So what is happening is that the male of the of the species of buffalo is killed within two years of its birth. Um, they they are saying forty five percent of the whole stock is killed, uh, male stock is killed within uh, uh, within two years of birth. So actually, uh, any male born is either let allowed to waste or slaughtered, and in fact. Um, Calf meat, buffalo calf meat, I, if you want to look at uh, uh, kind of pictures which will give you a bad night, you can go to the 
as website of any one of the exporters, uh, beef exporters from Uttar Pradesh. And the kind of pictures they give you of the calves and the kind of bobby, bobby meat or bob meat that they call uh, is not uh, uh, easy to look at. And the, uh, they'll also give description of how this, these calves for this kind of killing are grown and how their meat is, how they are slaughtered, how they are cut in pieces. So. But uh, this again, your slaughter does this, that distorts, completely distorts the, the structure of, uh, of the herd there. Again, uh, uh, where the slaughter is not done, the structure is very different. Say in Chhattisgarh, females are lesser than males amongst the buffaloes. And you see calves uh, as only this proportion and adults as this, as it should be. So, uh, while well, here you see the males are only this much and amongst them, there are only these many adults. So, what you do to them as an enterprise is all seen in the data in this case because uh, with animals you can be much more experimental. So, whatever policy you, you set up, you are able to execute in numbers. Now, uh, this uh, Chhattisgarh is one state which doesn't do uh, slaughter. And not only it doesn't do slaughter, it has made its act in a way that the slaughter of buffalo is impossible. And there's a, the reason of it, Chhattisgarh is a, like most of India, Chhattisgarh is also a rice growing state. And for, for paddy cultivation, male buffalo is an important animal. That the kicher banate hai, so uh, it's the males of the of the buffaloes who are better capable of doing it than bullocks. So their law, I was interested. I, I didn't know that laws are written like that in India even today. Uh, it's a very simple law. It says that in this act, unless the context otherwise requires, beans beef means flesh of agricultural cattle. And then in the definition, it will say agricultural cattle means an animal specified in the schedule. And the schedule will say agricultural animal cattle are cows of all ages, calves of cows and of sheep buffaloes, bulls, bullocks, male and female buffalo. So nothing is excluded. And no loophole is left for excluding anything. Uh, in fact, the, even the preamble is very interesting. It says, an act to provide in the interest of general public and to maintain communal harmony and peace for prohibition of slaughter of agriculture and for matters connected thereto. Now, this, uh, that it is in the interest of general public and to maintain communal harmony and peace is a clear upfront statement as to why we need to protect the cattle in India. And the provision clause is very simple. No person shall slaughter or cause to be slaughtered or offer or cause to be offered for slaughter of any agriculture cattle. Period. There are no exceptions written here. No person shall possess beef of any agriculture cattle slaughtered in contravention of the provision right. This is only, this is one place where they have tried to put slaughtered in contravention of the provision of this act, which means you can import beef from other states because uh, if it is not killed in Chhattisgarh, then you can have beef is what it means and I don't know why this is kept. And this provision on transport is also very clear. No person shall sell or transport or offer to transport or cause to be transported in from any place within the state to any place within the state or outside the state for the purpose of its slaughter in contravention of the provision of the sect or with the knowledge that it will be or is likely to be so slaughtered. A, one of the clearest acts that uh, the Chhattisgarh, this was made uh, in 2004 after the state was. Compare it with the Uttar Pradesh Act. Uttar Pradesh Act, uh, the title is Prevention of Cow Slaughter Act. It is not prevention of slaughter of agricultural animals. 
and it's 1955 act which has been amended several times what i'm reading out is the amended act i think the last amendment would have been 2011 preamble says wherever it is expedient to prohibit and prevent the slaughter of cow so the chatisgarh act is a matter of public policy the preamble says this is a matter of public policy uh, for the welfare of the general public and for maintain communal harmony this act says that it is a matter of expediency from the from the state i i don't know why this is written in this manner but this is how unless there is a political direction this is how the laws will be drafted definition says if this sec unless there is anything repugnant to the subject in context beef means flesh of cow but does not include such flesh contained in sealed containers and imported as such into uttar pradesh now there also they have put something as the clause but where did this come from sealed containers and imported into into as such into uttar pradesh where is the sealed container flesh is coming from and where they wanted why they do they wanted to be sold in well where there are prohibitions you are not allowed to bring thing those things in sealed containers which islamic country will allow you to bring alcohol in sealed containers even passing through your your territory and why did they think of this except as here in accepted and not withstanding anything contained in another law for the time being in force no person shall sell or transport or offer for sale or transport or cause to be sold or transported beef or beef products in any form except for such medicinal purposes as may be prescribed from where has this come well, I, i couldn't even understand what is happening oh, you are just creating loophole after loophole then there is further exception a person may sell and serve or cause to be sold and served serve beef or beef products for consumption by a bona fide passenger in an aircraft or railway train some madness has come to this why are we saying this kind of things except that we have doubt about what we are trying to implement what we are trying to implement now this provision of transport says no person transport or offer for transport or class to be transported any cow or bull or bullock the slaughter where of in any place in uttar pradesh punishable in this act from any place within the state to any place outside the state except in the permit issued by an officer now uh, this is export from of cow from uttar pradesh to another state for the purpose of slaughter okay? and they are saying you can do it by a permit issued by an authorized officer of the government of uttar pradesh and the act further says that the fees for this permit will be not be more than 500 rupees so you can in the, that put in the act not in the rules so they are saying that you can export cow from uttar pradesh for the purpose of slaughter if you pay fees of 500 rupees to the government of uttar pradesh what kind of law is this why did they why are they thinking of this kind of things the uh, such uh, such officer shall issue the permit on payment of such fees not exceeding 500 rupees for every cow or bullock as may be prescribed and it says shall issue the permit it doesn't say may issue the permit that there is no other condition except payment of rupees 500 and you can take the cow from uttar pradesh to elsewhere for the purpose of for the purpose of slaughter for the explicit purpose of slaughter actually any anyway, uh, that's how it is uh, i'll show you one more photograph this is from a place near chatisgarh not from madhya pradesh from from the singrauli district which uh, which adjoins and uh, uh, this is a pair of bullocks this is a pair of uh, male buffaloes uh, in fact i have hardly seen anywhere else uh, bullocks and buffaloes uh, male buffalo working together in this field Uh, this is a very interesting sight, and this is very hard work, by the way, because uh, you when you take the plow through through mud, it's extremely hard. Normally, bullocks are unable to do it. Uh, 
Mill Buffalo produces much more of torque than a, uh, a bullock. There's another photo. This is from Bundelkhand. The uh, buffaloes love to wallow in mud. Uh, we should let them do it. We should not start wallowing in mud. Wallowing in mud for this purpose. <laughs> Uh, this, of course, this was uh, uh, in a village, just outside a village in a pond. I've never seen so many of buffaloes in a single pond together. But uh, the numbers have, are really large in the area near around Chhattisgarh. And uh, the numbers are also large almost everywhere else in the North India. Uh, in South India, still you do not see that many buffaloes in South India, still largely the milk available will be of the cow, uh, good or bad. But uh, uh, in North India, we have uh, partly because of the kind of laws we made, largely because of the kind of abettors we have set up in the last 20-25 years. Initially, it was because the tractors came and keeping a bullock. Tractors came and uh, uh, we started this dwarf variety of of uh, uh, of wheat and uh, rice, so that there is not enough straw for the cattle. So uh, people stopped keeping the uh, bullocks for the draft purposes. They start keeping start keeping the buffaloes for uh, for uh, milk purposes. Um, but uh, it is not a matter of technology that uh, bullock will be useful, cow will be useful. Any time, whether you have good technology or you do not have. Namaste. You have heard Dr. Bajaj ki puri presentation. Now, the question is: What can you do? So, there are two things you can do. In the UP, there are two things in the Prevention of Cow Slaughter Act 1955. Hai, usse छत्तीसगढ़ एग्रीकल्चरल कैटल प्रिजर्वेशन एक्ट 2004 से रिप्लेस करना पड़ेगा। छत्तीसगढ़ का एग्रीकल्चरल कैटल प्रिजर्वेशन एक्ट बहुत ही मॉडर्न है और केवल दो पेज का एक्ट है और ये जो सारी लिंचिंग और कैटल थेफ्ट और लिंचिंग ये जो सारी सोशल स्ट्राइफ है ये सब पूरा एक दम यूपी में बंद हो जाएगा अगर ये एक्ट अमेंड हो जाए आप पूरी प्रेजेंटेशन देखिए और जो आप उससे सीखें अपने एमपी को होम मिनिस्टर अमित शाह जी को प्राइम मिनिस्टर नरेंद्र मोदी जी को और एग्रीकल्चर मिनिस्टर को अपीडा जो ऑर्गेनाइजेशन है जो सारा एक्सपोर्ट को हैंड होल्ड करती है उन सबको चिट्ठियां डालना शुरू करिए कि ये बीफ का एक्सपोर्ट जो है भारत से इसे बैन करना होगा सिर्फ बयासी स्लॉटर हाउसेज हैं और ये आसानी से बैन करे जा सकते हैं इसी तरह से ट्विटर पर आप छोटे छोटे अपने फोन से वीडियोस बना सकते हैं और ये सब वीडियोस अमित शाह जी और नरेंद्र मोदी जी को सबको टैग कर कर थोड़ा वायरल करिए तो ऐसी दो तीन चीज़ें अगर आप करेंगे तो इसमें इम्पैक्ट बढ़ता है और केवल फेसबुक ट्विटर और यूट्यूब में कमेंट्स डालकर काम ना ख़त्म करें इस थोड़ा सा इसको एक्टिविज़म को आगे बढ़ाएँ नमस्ते